are full of grace and truth, that you're the truth, and you're the way, and you're the life, and all that would come to the Father is through the Son, Jesus, who not only was born in a manger, but died on a cross, paying for the sins of the world, now resurrected, ever liveth to make intercession for us. Bless this message today from your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. God's purposes for the incarnation. Somebody would say that does not understand that terminology. What does our incarnation mean? It means God became flesh and yet remained God to dwell among us. So Jesus was both God and he was both human being. It is the mystery of Almighty God, the creator of all things, the creator of each and every one of you. At this time of the year, you are likely to see representatives of the baby Jesus in uh, Christmas cards, and I received some beautiful ones today. And the ones that bless me are not Santa Claus or even beautiful winter scenes. It's about Jesus Christ, for that's what Christmas is really all about. You'll see it in Christmas cards. You'll see it in church dramas. Many churches have abilities to get together a beautiful, beautiful presentation in a play, a drama of the manger and all that happened during that time. But you will also see it in manger scenes wherever they're found. We used to find them all over the place, even in public, but now they have tabooed that and you have to do it in certain places that are permitted. Well, I can tell you, God goes in places that are not permitted, and he does it through television, he does it through internet, he does it through you, and he does it through me. You can't keep the word of God bound. It will be proclaimed by God Almighty. They tried to destroy the printing press that would produce the Bibles, and God destroyed the one who owned the printing press that wouldn't produce Bibles. And Bibles on his printing press after he died were all printed all over the world. And God does that. You've heard of God's smuggler, people that will smuggle the word of God into nations. And sometimes those in authority look the other way because they know it is good to have these Bibles there. Right now, they're saying in China, don't have any Bibles. And if you openly meet, you've got to tell me exactly what you're going to preach on. And if you don't preach on what is permitted by the government, then we'll put you in a concentration camp. The world doesn't like the good news, which I can't even understand. But the world hates Jesus. And yet they can't tell you why they hate him. They just hate him because it's in their genes to hate God because of sin. And only when you receive Christ as your Savior do you fall in love with Jesus Christ. I've fallen in love with Jesus Christ. And for me, this time of the year and Easter are the best times of the year because it is a time when you can freely say, this is about Jesus. This is about Jesus. What goes through your mind when you see a manger scene? Do you see the story that's in the Word of God? Or do you see something that somebody's trying to make out of that, that crash or that manger scene? And what they try to make out of it is a cute baby, and that's good. Let's celebrate that. But don't tell me what that baby grew up to teach. But you see... The word of God cannot be bound. It will go everywhere. Most Christians are aware that John the baptizer said this. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And this is the Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world. Some even recognize the close connection between 
Christmas and Easter, but they never go to the point where they receive the Christ of Christmas and Easter as their Lord and Savior. As wonderful as it may be to know what the Bible says, it's more wonderful to have Christ living inside of you and really understand what the Bible is talking about when it talks about Jesus, the incarnation, and the Word becoming flesh. Let's look at four purposes that God has for the incarnation. The Apostle Paul explains something very interesting here. He said, I want you to understand that we were blessed more than we can even imagine by the incarnation of Jesus Christ. It says this in Galatians 2.16 and Galatians 3.24. We are not justified by works of the law. The Old Testament said you had to be if you were going to get to heaven, you had to keep the law. And uh, the Ten Commandments and the law, which was more than that, could not be fulfilled by mankind. The Word of God makes it very clear it was a tutor to lead us to Christ. When we found out that we could not save ourselves, we needed somebody that would take that place for us and save us, and that was Jesus I remember when I was in my first ministry in Wolfboro Falls, uh, New Hampshire. This is what was going around at that time. We can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We can become good. I have never seen that happen. In fact, there's more violence in the world than has ever been. You only have to turn on your TV to any broadcast that the world puts out and you see violence upon violence upon violence upon violence. Man has not become better in all those years that I've been ministering. He's become worse and only because mankind will not accept Jesus Christ and his message of salvation. If I don't accept it, then I'm in trouble because it's the only way to eternal life. Some people say, that's so narrow. That's so narrow. There are many ways. There's got to be many ways. There's many religions. And as somebody said, as they were preaching this morning, but all those leaders of all those religions are dead. Our Savior is alive and doing well. And he's coming back, and he's interceding for us day and night. We've got the true thing. We've got the real facts. Because Jesus rose again from the dead on the third day. What could have changed those disciples like they were changed from fearful, hiding, to bold men that would die for the cause of Jesus Christ? They saw Jesus alive after he'd been crucified. They saw a living Savior, and that transformed their life so that they were willing to die for Christ and for the message that Christ taught. Are we willing to die for Christ if that was what would happen to us? Do we really believe the Word of God? Is Christmas real to us, or is it some nice story that we like to hear? We like to set up creches in our homes. We like to sing Christmas carols. But do we really know Jesus? Do we really know Jesus as God in the flesh to dwell among us? By revealing that we have no capacity to keep the law of God. Remember what Jesus said? He said, if you break one of the Ten Commandments, you've broken them all. If you think to break one of the commandments, you've broken them all. How can I possibly say I've never thought any of the Ten Commandments to do them, to uh, violate them? Of course I've thought it. And that's why I'm a sinner needing Jesus. And Jesus paid the price. And all to him I owe. It is more than just a baby in a crib. It's a Savior entering the world to redeem mankind from the curse of the flesh by revealing what constitutes transgressions in God's eyes. The law brings us to the realization that all have sinned 
and all have come short of what God expects. I would expect nothing more of a person that had not received Christ as Savior. They're going to want to kill, to murder, to, to live a life of all kinds of wickedness. They're going to because that's the flesh, that's the sin nature, that's the way they were born. But when Jesus changes a life, when you come into a place where you receive Jesus as your Savior, you are transformed so that you don't want to do those things. And if you do them, it makes you feel guilty and you ask God's forgiveness. There are people I'm ministering to on the Internet, on Facebook, and one particular person I remember ministering to just last night, I gave her the, the way of salvation. She says, I'm nothing. I'm no good. I don't have any reason to live. And that's what she was saying, even though she didn't voice it. And I said, but Jesus Christ can make you a better person than you've ever been. He can transform your life. He can fulfill your needs that you want me to fulfill in giving you money. He can give you all things freely because you'll be his child. And you know what? She's contemplating whether she's going to receive Christ. But she's still there and she's still going to hear the gospel message. She's still going to hear that God can take care of her life. I wouldn't even quote to you what she said to me she felt like. But I can tell you this. It was not something I'd want to feel like. She's lost. She's in France, and she's lost. And God is reaching people all over the world through Internet. We've got 780, 80, one or two or 85, 785 different hits that have befriended us. And God is reaching the world through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not anything we do. It's what God has done. And God is doing a great work out there, friends. And when we get to heaven, we're going to find out how much this little church really meant in the world because it's a light on the hill shining for Jesus Christ. I thank God for every one that supports this ministry in some way because you're making the word of God spread into places that we never even imagined it spread into. People are listening to us and being changed by the word of God, and that is the way it should be. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Do not think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. He didn't come to abolish them. What does he say? I do not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I could not keep the law. I could not keep what the prophets told me to do. I had to have somebody come and do it for me. And Jesus, God's son, so loved the world that he came in the place of me and died on the cross bearing my sin and your sin in his own body. So says the precious word of God. Please note number one on the screen, if you will. The first way Christ fulfilled the law was by personal obedience to it. Personal obedience to it. He never broke the law, the Ten Commandments and the other commandments that were given beside all of that. The law of the Old Testament involved more than the Ten Commandments according to the Word of God given unto Moses. God handed down, get this, 613 moral ceremonial and civic requirements before the Hebrew people reached the promised land. And Jesus fulfilled every one of them, never violated one of them. He was without sin. Can I say that of myself? No. I can say that of Jesus because Jesus' father was God the Father in heaven. God used a human mother but he did not pass on the curse through mankind with a human father. God was the father of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus would say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Or hear my beloved son. He would always refer to his Jesus on this earth as God in the flesh. And God in the flesh showed us what the father was like. He was just like the son in every respect, in every respect. All together then, all these laws Jesus fulfilled in your place, in my place. So we'll never have to fulfill them. In Christ, they've been fulfilled. I've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Number two on the screen, if you will. Jesus was born under this code, these laws, and he kept the entire body of legislation in all its five points so that he could redeem mankind and bring us into God's family. Galatians 4, verses 4 to 5. The only way I could become a member of the family of God was through receiving Jesus Christ as my Savior. And without receiving Christ, there is no other way to heaven, so says the word of the living God. People try to climb in another way, and the Bible calls them thieves and robbers, and they can't get into heaven another way. You can't get into heaven by Buddha. You can't get into heaven by Mohammed. You just can't get into heaven by any of these false gods. It's only through Jesus Christ that I can get to heaven. I wouldn't want to say the word of God wasn't true. Because in saying the word of God isn't true, I have no way to get to heaven according to it. But I have received Christ as my Savior. And as a result of that, I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the King with Jesus, my Savior. I'm a child of the King, and the King is God Almighty. It's God Almighty. The prophets had much to say about the coming Messiah. People missed it because they thought it was Israel. But it wasn't talking about Israel. In Isaiah 53, when it talks about the suffering servant, they thought that was Israel. But if you look at it really deeply, you find out it can't be Israel. It's talking exactly about Jesus Christ. And Jesus shows that when he comes and he's on this earth, despised and rejected of men. You see... People misunderstand the word of God or misinterpret it because they try to make it about somebody but Jesus. But it's all about Jesus. You've got to start with a premise. The Bible is telling you what about Jesus. He's a promised Messiah. Then he comes as the Messiah. He's the coming king, and he is the coming conqueror. He is all things. Take a look up there in this this beautiful flag and you will find out that God is more than that he's far more than that number three if you will go to that second his life on earth proved that every single scriptural messianic prediction was true every single scripture about the coming messiah is found its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Every messianic, that's talking about the Messiah that was to come. And how did they know this in the Old Testament? Years before Jesus fulfilled it, they knew it because God the Father and God the Son had revealed it through the prophets of God. And they didn't believe the prophets of God in that day, and many don't believe the prophets of God today. And as a result, they don't know Jesus has come. Israel has gone into their land, God's special people, blinded, blinded because they can't see that Jesus is the fulfillment of the messianic passages that talk about him. But one day, the Bible says, every one of their eyes will be opened. They will see it. Let us not wait on that day as people 
that live on this earth, but open our eyes to it being so today, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be lost or found, because there is people that have received Christ that still are ignorant of the prophecies and the fulfillment, and they need to be taught the word of God, and we have the privilege of simply teaching us, teaching them, excuse me, this book, it's called the Bible. Now, since each foretold details, each of these prophecies foretold details of the coming of Jesus Christ, literally, we know that the prophecies that still are future will be 100% fulfilled in details. They will not be, well, some of them are fulfilled, some of them there isn't. You know, when I was younger, about a week ago, they had these predictions every year. Gene Dixon and all those kinds of people would predict what's going to happen in the next year. And they were actually prophesying what's going to happen. And not all of their prophecies came true. You know what would happen to a prophet if one of his prophecies didn't come true? He'd be killed. He'd be stoned to death. My friends, never speak for God unless you are backing it with the word of God. Someone has said, yeah, God is doing a new thing. Uh, he gets us to laugh like crazy and we can't control it. In some churches they do that and they can't control it. That's not God at all. That's not God at all. When you can't control yourself, when God says possess your own vessel, when you can't control yourself, it isn't God. God says, I will tell you the way to go, and you've got a choice. You've got a choice. You can go that way, or you can resist, but you will get the consequences of resisting the word of God. There's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the ways there are of are not good according to the word of the living God. Now, understand then, because God has done that for us, note number four. A third way Jesus fulfilled the law was by dying on the cross. The law says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, if somebody's going to take my place and die in my place, then I can be freed from that judgment. And if I'm free from that judgment, I can't be judged for the same crime someone has paid for and said, I'll take it. I'll take it. Jesus took your judgment and my judgment on himself and said, I'll take their judgment I'll take every single person that will ever be born in this world. I'll take their judgment upon me, and I will pay for it completely. And when Jesus said on that cross, it is finished, he had paid for all the sins of the entire world from beginning to end. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to go to heaven. That means you're not going to heaven because of your sins. The way you go to heaven is by receiving Christ. And if you don't receive Christ, then you must pay for your sins in hell. And that's what the word of God says. Jesus paid, but you won't let him pay yours. So you merit what he's already paid for. It's a sin of rejecting what he has done on the cross for you. My friends, don't think about it. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, invite him into your life. Ask him to forgive your sins and fill you with his presence and live a life through you that will glorify him. The word of God says he fulfilled the law by paying for our judgment. He was the final offering, the final sacrificial offering. And as Jesus was related to in John 1, 29 by John the Baptist, he points at Jesus as he's coming uh, from the temptations that he had. And he says, behold, gaze at the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sins of the world. Don't say, not me. I don't want him to take away my sins. And you know there are people that actually say that. I don't want to hear it. I don't want Jesus in my life. My friends, pray for them. Pray for them. According to Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Since no one is sinless, according to Isaiah 53, verse 6, we all owe a debt for our transgressions, and it is Jesus who's doing the willing to pay for it. But you and I have to make that decision. Lord, I let you pay for it for me. Number five, and God's justice demands payment for this debt, such a debt. If Jesus Christ had not come to pay our penalty, we would have to have paid it ourselves. Do you realize that all of us at birth and until the age of accountability came, we were destined for hell. When the age of accountability came, God said, now I, I won't send you to hell as a child, but if you don't receive Christ, now that you know the difference between good and evil, and you know that God saves those who will receive him. So as a youngster, I receive Christ as my Savior. But if you don't receive Christ and you have come to that age of knowledge, when you can tell the difference between right and wrong and you presented the gospel, then there is no other way to heaven. There is no other way. Jesus came to give you a way to heaven. Don't ever deny that for yourself, but thank God for it over and over and over. You remember well, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That word begotten in another translation is unique son. There was no other God, men. He was unique. God gave his son that whosoever believes in him receives him and his sin offering for their sin should not perish. Perish does not mean going out of existence but going to hell for eternity. And by the way, you don't go to hell and see other people and you don't have Satan rule in it either. It is a place of isolation and torment. You don't want to go there. He came that you would not perish if you received him but have eternal life. I'm so glad I've got eternal life. I'm so glad that to be absent from the body for me because I receive Christ as my Savior is to be present with God. I don't go to purgatory. I'm present with God. There is no reason for anyone to go to purgatory. If Jesus paid it all, how can they pay and how can I help them to pay for their indiscretions and their sins? That's foolishness. God bless our Catholic friends, but the scriptures don't agree with you. Not at all. The fourth way Jesus fulfilled the law is probably the most familiar to Christians. Note number six on the screen. He came to enlarge upon the law, bringing fuller understanding than even the religious leadership had. Now, remember the man that came to Jesus and he said, how can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, keep the law. And this man said, I've kept the law from, uh, from my youth up. I've kept it. I've never violated it. How deceptive that is. He kept the letter, but he didn't keep the spirit of it. Jesus came to point out, no, you didn't keep the law. For example, he said, thou shalt not commit adultery. That was understood as referring to the act of adultery, but Jesus amplified it, meaning it was to even look lustfully at a woman. Lustfully. Even to glance and look and keep looking. As Billy Graham has said and others, you can not keep the bird from landing in your hair, but you don't have to let it make a nest in you, uh, in your hair. And some people are making 
you know, let it build a nest. Don't do that. Don't do that. But he said, you haven't kept that law, and you think you have. You haven't kept the law of thou shalt not lie, and you think you have. You never killed anyone, and you wish somebody was dead. You have violated that law. So Jesus came to show them, because they were duped into thinking by Satan that they kept the law, and they were all right. No, you haven't. God fully explained it so they would understand they needed a Savior. We need a Savior. Note, please, number seven on the screen. His arrival meant the fulfillment of the law. Jesus' arrival meant the fulfillment of the law. We couldn't keep it. Jesus kept it for us. When we receive Christ as our Savior, we have kept it in Jesus, not in our own ability, but in Jesus Christ, so that we become his children, and God will spank us if we get off, but he will not divorce us. He will not cast us off. So the night the Lord Jesus was born was more than happen, a certain thing like he was born, and that's cute. It was a fulfillment of God Almighty's law that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. It was a fulfillment that unless you can have somebody keep the law in your place, you're going to hell, and there's no way to heaven. So Jesus becomes so important. He instructed the people to pray in this way, Our Father, which is in heaven, when you receive Christ as your Savior, you have a Father, and He's in heaven. It's not talking about an earthly Father. It's talking about your heavenly Father. And He said, I want to be very close to you. I want to be the best Father you've got. And so He says, you can go and say, Abba, Father, or Daddy, Daddy, and it's that close I want to be to you. Open your door and let me in, and I will fellowship with you just a little talk with Jesus makes it right as the hymn goes Jesus did more than tell us about the father he showed us the father he said if you have seen me you have seen the father we are totally alike we are the same I am God in the flesh Number eight. In other words, the Lord Jesus is the full likeness and reflection of the Father. Philip was to say, show us the Father, Jesus, and that will be all we need. And he said, Philip, have I been with you so long and you don't know who I am? And I think there are loads of Christians who really don't know who Jesus is. They know about him. They know he saved them from their sins, but they don't know him personally. And God wants to know you personally. He wants to be the most important person in your life, in my life. We must allow him to be that, or we cannot rely upon him in troubles and trials. It was very important to God that his children understand who he was and what he was like. And so he said, please look at my son. That's who I am and that's what I'm like. Number nine, he wants us to know that he is not merely a God of holiness, wrath, and justice, and he is a God of holiness, wrath, and judgment. Of justice, but he is also loving, kind, and merciful. Someone said in the Old Testament, he's a horrible God. He's a terrible God. And in the New Testament, he's a loving God. You haven't read either of the books. He is both uh, all of these things in both the Old and the New Testament. He's just showing you his love, perhaps, more than you know in the New Testament. But people died for not following him and living their own way in the New Testament as well. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? If you don't, you need to read the word of God. 
Jesus came to testify to the truth. Number 10, the truth is that man without Christ is lost, which means that by choosing disobedience, a person is separated from God. God wants us reconciled to him. Note number 11, if you will. Christmas is God's marvelous, eternal provision for mankind, the means by which every one of us can have a personal, personal relationship with our Creator and be freed from the bondage of sin. If we don't get to know Jesus now, when will we? This is the place we can serve God the best. In heaven, it's all wonderful and cleansed and pure and spotless. Here, we have to represent Jesus because there are people lost and lonely and discouraged. Jesus came to give abundant life as well. Abundant life. Can you truly say you have abundant life or humdrum life? Abundant life comes by getting to know Jesus and trusting him. Number 12, to the mind of God, it is not enough that we should receive forgiveness of sins and thereby just look forward to eternal life. He wants us to have abundant life right here, right now, John 10, 10. He wants you to have a life worth living, a great life, a joyful life. A, a, you know, some people have said, I won't receive Christ, I'll lose all my fun. You get fun when you receive Christ. You know God loves you. You know God has forgiven you. You know God has a plan for your life. You know that God watches over you, and that nothing can happen that he doesn't turn into a blessing in the end. You know this because the word of God says this, and therefore you have what is called a life worth living, abundant life. The message of Christmas is that the eternal God Son of God, the eternal loving God, came to dwell among men, and also through in his indwelling Holy Spirit, he lives with inside, inside of each of us who have received him as our Savior. I have the Holy Spirit to guide me. I have the Holy Spirit to make me feel guilty if I don't let him guide me. I have the Holy Spirit to show me the way to live. If you've already received Christ as your Savior, then abide in him. Live and get to know him personally. If you have not received Christ as your Savior, then you need to receive him before it's too late. One breath away, eternity takes over. And if you haven't received Christ, there's only one place God can send you. And it is a place that he does not want to send you. It is hell. Won't you receive Christ? Let's bow for prayer. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior and you're watching by the Internet or public access or any place that the video is going, then why not receive him now? Jesus wants you to have a great Christmas. It can come if you receive Christ, the greatest gift that God ever gave. Just say these words, dear Jesus. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. I want you to take over my life. I want to live for you, and I want to be saved by your grace. I really want to experience Christmas through receiving you as my Savior. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have made that decision, please let us know. Don't be silent about it. We'd love to hear from you that you receive Christ as your Savior through this broadcast. You simply write, if you're in the United States, to the Bible Speaks, 40 Belvedere Street, Lakeport, New Hampshire, zip code 03246. And if you're on the Internet, then simply email us at ourhornet 2 
at metricast.net. God bless you. Until next week at this time.